Let's get started with our conversation, shall we? We're turning our attention uh, to some of the big stories that concern the economy at the sub-nationals and even when it comes to the banking sector, we have joining us to walk us through those very important talking points. Dr. Nemeka Obiariri, who's a development economist and investment banking executive. He joins us uh, via Zoom from right here in Lagos. Good morning, sir. Welcome to the Morning Brief. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And I'll just start with the big one, and that's the fact that recently the DMO released documents uh, showing the debt profile across board, the state, the FCT, and the federal government. But what caught the attention of a lot of people uh, is the debt incurred, said to have been incurred, by 13 new state governors, and they've not even spent one year in office. And that has brought up that classic debate yet again. Why borrow in the first place? Is that a good thing? Some say, well, you can't do without borrowing. You just need to be transparent and accountable to the people. Some say these states have a huge debt burden already. I mean, you had the governor of Kaduna State talking about what he inherited from the previous governor. So uh, walk us through this new data we're seeing. What do you see when you look at it? Uh, basically, uh, the question we should be asking ourselves is what did they borrow to invest in? Uh, debt itself or leveraging is not bad in the real sense of it. You borrow to invest in critical infrastructure. You borrow to invest in projects that will yield returns, that will enable you to repay back your loan, the interest portion, and at least stimulate economic activities. <laughs> Basically, the question we should be asking this governor is, what are they borrowing for? If, you know, the, we will normally cite, if you ask this usual classical economy, they will tell you, oh, um, South Africa has a standard debt of $78 billion. Um, U.S. has a standard debt that is uh, almost 100% of their GDP. They will cite Japan. But these guys forgot that these borrowers were not borrowed to consume or to loot. They borrowed it to invest. And you can see the revenue. In South Africa, last year alone, their total revenue was almost about $126 billion. And we simply mean Cetaris Paribus. The South Africans can decide to liquidate the external loan within nine months. In the case of Nigeria, we've been borrowing and freighting the monies away. I'll give you another example. Ethiopia Djibouti borrowed $4.5 billion to do 754 kilometers standard gauge rail line through atrocious landscape, mountainous landscape, at a cost of $5.9 million, million per kilometer. And even the Ethiopians queried such magnitude of investment. They felt it was riddled with corruption. What was the of investment? To create a pathway into the sea, because Ethiopia is landlocked, to enable them to stimulate economic activities and evacuate their goods and services and exports. Case of Nigeria, 156 kilometer Lagos to Ibadan Ray project. Landscape that is smooth, not atrocious. We, we, were, we borrowed $1.9496 billion at an average cost of $12.9 billion million dollars per kilometer by the same Chinese, the same Chinese technology. What does that show you? The World Bank standard says average cost of a kilometer of a standard rail project is $3.5 million. That simply means in case of Nigeria, we borrowed atrociously. We did our own road at a cost of almost 150% of the Ethiopians. So the question is, what are we borrowing to do? The 23 trillion naira that was printed and frittered away, that is causing the problem we have under Buhari. If we had invested that 23 trillion in agriculture, today we would have created nothing less than 3 million jobs. I would be generating nothing less than 33 trillion naira into this economy annually for what will happen. But the problem is that they borrowed, they shared, they looted, and they consumed. So it is worrisome. Borrowing in itself is not a problem. But you must borrow to invest in critical assets that will yield your return on the same currency you borrowed or that will catalyze economic activities in every sector of the economy that will enable you to generate productive activities that will earn enough revenue to pay back the debt and the interest and stimulate economic activities. Today, total national debt profile is $107 trillion, up from $12 trillion as of June 30th, 2015. External debt is up by $43 trillion, $43 billion, up from $10 billion as of June 30th, 2015. We are not talking about the way I missed that is with $3 trillion naira plus $7 trillion naira accumulated interest. 
and the 10 trillion that was wasted through diverse intervention mechanisms that did not yield any results. That is what we are grappling today. And that is what you see in Mr. Cardoso with the limited options available to him, trying to see how he can manipulate and manage the monetary policy rates to be able to achieve. Yeah, please go ahead. So that is it. Right. So for us to grow this economy, we must borrow tight to assets. I'll give you an example. I, I, I do not know the rationale for us to borrow, to do rail projects from Kanu to Maradi. When we have the most lucrative rail route in Nigeria, which is the Lagos, Shagamu, Ijebode, Ore, um, Benin, Asaba, Onicha, Owere, to Port Harcourt, Sebko back to Umwaya, Aba, back to Okiwe, to Enugu, to Abakeleke, to Onicha. Now, it is already proven through research that road, the Southwest Southeast Railroad, South South Railroad, has a, 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 a tonnage traffic, cargo traffic of about two annually. It has a passenger traffic of almost about 500 million passenger traffic annually. If you run the numbers, today the average cost per ton per mile of cargo transport within that route is almost about 120 naira per cargo per ton mile. If we do that rail route on an annual basis, that rail route will catalyze economic activities that will result in nothing less than $5 billion revenue within the axis. If we decide to borrow $6.5 billion to do that rail, rail route, which is about, about 1,085 kilometers, in, in seven years, under a design, build, operate, and transfer arrangement, federal government of Nigeria will underwrite it. If we do it, 45 years DBOT, in seven years, investors will recover their monies. It's a lucrative rail route if we use it and link it to the coastal rail route that will cover the whole of West Africa. Nigeria, under the ACTFA framework, will use it to be the hub for the whole of West Africa. But those who borrow should be thinking critically. Borrowing is very good. But you must borrow against assets. You must borrow against projects. You must borrow against activities that will catalyze productivity and be able to repay those. And that is one, one that is not what we are having today in Nigeria across the three tiers of government. So are you questioning the quality of leadership and their understanding of basic economics? You see, it's not just questioning. It's, it's the lack of patriotism. It's the lack of sincerity behind the borrowing. I'll give you another example. One of the reasons why we have yet trapped with peasant families is because we have not mechanized agriculture across the 8,809 electoral ward. There was a proposal we raised in 2019 when the Buhari government muted the idea of borrowing $1.1 billion to import 10,000 tractors. We shared with them a proposal. We have been talking to a lot of Chinese companies. China today has over 98% food self-sufficiency. China has some of the biggest agro-value chain in China. And we've been talking to some Chinese firms who are very bullish in tractor and bulldozer manufacturing. And they are willing to come to Nigeria to set up an assembly plant. And we shared it with those in power then. And what was the whole idea? These guys will set up a, a assembly plant in Nigeria that can do CKDs. And then they, they will supply both tractor and the D7 bulldozer, the Chinese equivalent, at an all-in cost of $82,000. Tractor and bulldozer and all the accessories. And they will train Nigerians, and the clusters will be done under PPP arrangement that will enable us to cultivate about 15 million hectares of new upstream farm gates. This, this current government now, we just saw the Minister for Agri, repeating the same mistake the Buhari government did, signing MOU to import 10,000 tractors under a public sector arrangement that will cost the same $1.1 billion, billion. Does it make sense to you that we can spend $750 million and import both tractor and bulldozer? And somebody is trying to spend $1.1 billion to import only tractor. Does this make sense to you? And that is the kind of things we see in Nigeria. Under the structure that we shared with them, that will be controlled through the Nigerian Sovereign Wealth Investment Authorities. You will have agro clusters in all the each of the 8,000, 8,000 electoral ward that will be managed by thoroughly trained mechanical engineers. Farmers within those clusters will hire those machines 
use it in their farm gate at an average cost of not more than 40,000 naira per acre. And when you do it, you will stimulate economic activities, you will grow jobs, you will have over 50 billion um, dollars to Niger economy, and those loans can be repaid within three years or five years. But these guys in power, I feel sorry for, but I always say it, the president is not omnipresence, the president is not omniscient. Bible says in Proverbs 25.5, if you surround a king with wicked people, they will even force a righteous king to do wickedly. But if you surround a king with wise men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they will guide him to govern well. How can a minister in Nigeria today want to repeat the same mistake that happened under the Buhari chief? It's something we should be asking ourselves. Mr. Biare, the question is, are we seeing these um, uh, evidence of infrastructure development uh, in spite of the borrowings? And it's quite concerning, really, because the report says 13 new governors have borrowed to the tune of 226.8 billion naira in six months alone. And they have increased um, earnings from the FAC allocation by about 40 to 50 percent, according to re uh, the report uh, uh, coming from uh, FAC. Uh, so, do you see the justification for these increased uh, borrowing, despite the fact that they have increased FAC allocation? And then if you also consider uh, the excuse that some of them are presenting, that they're recording increase in internally generated revenue. The question is, despite all of that, do they have a strong debt to payment ratio, uh, uh, a terminology that there they is, often use? There is, there is no justification. And, and he's so disheartening. You know, we always put so much emphasis at the center without looking at what happened at the subnational level, which is where the focus should be, because there are those nearer to the grassroots. I was privileged to speak to the PDP Governors Forum in 2019, and I shared with them an audacious vision on how they can grow agro wealth that will enhance security and curb desertifications in such a very scientific way that they can generate almost about $12.5 billion annually for one cash crop. And I will share it with you guys if time permits me. Saudi Arabia, as wealthy as they are in the oil area, in 2006 decided to develop the date palm plantation, which the Bible calls, when the Bible talked about a land flowing with milk and honey, the milk has to do with dairy products. The honey is from the date foods. From 2016 now, Saudi Arabia has developed over a million hectares of the date plantation. Is, Egypt is 95% desert. Egypt has almost about 1.7 million hectares of the dates. And they generate billions of dollars from that. I shared with them very audacious, simple plan. Nigeria is the only place in the whole wide world where the date plantation grows in the wild and fruits twice in a year. The 19 northern states, I share with the governors, even if you borrow, if you go to Aki Wuna Adesina today and say we want to borrow 100, 100 million dollars to focus on this, cultivating 50,000 hectares in every of the 19 northern states. In the next, I told them by 2019, if they do it in that 2019, 2020, by 2024, 2025, they will have developed 1 million hectares. They will have developed over 1,250 factories where it will be processed. And these agro parks will also be used to do infrastructure, pipe on water, to collocate the herdsmen, so that will, they will not be nomadic because they have been making excuses that is because there is no vegetation for them. Under this arrangement, they will create two million jobs, direct jobs. They will create nothing less than twelve thousand factory jobs. They will have twenty-five motorized, fully armed agro rangers in every of these one thousand two hundred and fifty clusters. And then they will generate on an annual basis $12.5 billion. Because as of today, a ton of the dead food is about $2,800. And a hectare does about 20 tons. This red, despite the fact that they have 95% desert, that is what they are doing. It's a $23 billion market that is expected to grow at a cumulative great, uh, gross average, uh, 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 um, growth rate of almost about 7.5% into the next 20 years. But these guys are not thinking that way. Go and look at what happened in Kantar State. Right. $585 million borrowed by the past governor, plus $85 billion naira. Ask him to show you what he did with that money. Right. And that is the most painful thing here. And Nigerians are not asking questions. I expect the average Nigerian to look inward. In the Southeast, it's the same thing. The palm oil industry used to, be a, used to contribute 45% of the global palm oil market in Nigeria in 1965. Michael, as a 39-year-old man, premier of Eastern Nigeria, 
They've looked 214 kilometer industrial belt and built that industrial belt using the palm oil. I shared with the governors of the Southeast on how they can under a simple PPP arrangement that does not cost them a cup of on fact and jack, how they can develop 1,126,000 1, new Tehana palm plantations across each of the 1,246 uh, electoral wards well, in the Dr. Barry, if I may comment that's... now, that there's so much brilliant ideas coming out of this conversation. And I mean, some will say Nigeria is not, I mean, we're not lacking in ideas, in the brilliant minds. Even those in government will tell you that, well, I know what I've done outside of government in the private sector. These ideas uh, I have worked on and they've been successful. And those people have been co-opted into government. And I imagine some of them will disagree with you uh, when you say that well, they are those responsible for this because they are the ones surrounding those in government. They will say, well, we give the ideas, we give the advice. It's only left to those in power to implement them or otherwise. I know the Zamfara state governor uh, has spoken about uh, the debt as well, saying, well, this is from the previous administration, the 20 billion bond or something like that. But let's dig deeper because some of these loans, in fact, a good number of them, always get the approval of the federal government, you know, the National Assembly before they are taken. So it, most times it's not just the state governments uh, that are involved in this in that sense. There's an approval process. They look at it, whether or not you're viable to repay back, uh, what it is you're tying those loans to. The question now is whether or not they are transparent. But let's also segue into the banking sector because, of course, the loans are sometimes gotten from the banking sector. Now, they have a serious issue on their hands, recapitalization. Yes, it is two years. Uh, they have two years to do that. Uh, but there are concerns. One, uh, saying the modus operandi, or at least uh, some of the uh, some of the, uh, the, the requirements from the CBN are uh, saying that you cannot put this in. It has to be strictly this. Uh, some say, well, that might be a tough ask. But you are involved in this sector. What do you see uh, with this recapitalization process? You see, the, the problem we have in Nigeria is that we tackle the symptoms and not the root cause of the problem. The problem we have in Nigeria is not because the banks are not properly capitalized. The problem we have in Nigeria is because the institutions of the state, the financial service delivery transmission mechanism is not doing what they're supposed to do. In 2005, when we embarked on this same assignment of recapitalizing the banks, we had a stable economy under Olusegun Obasanjo, an economy that was growing at about 6.65% per annum GDP. We had a middle class that was very buoyant, four million strong middle class. We, we had its reforms left and right, and everything was going well. And if you look at that time, as of January 2005, when 25 banks purportedly or allegedly met the requirements, our GDP there was about $175 billion. And if you look at the capitalization that time, it came to about $4.7 billion, there are about, which is about 2% of GDP. The problem we have is not recapitalizing the banks. The problem we have is that we have not yet fix the institutions of the state to be able to drive economic. This one of the reasons the CBN gave was that ah, they want to recapitalize the banks in preparation for their plan to grow a one trillion dollar economy. That does not make sense. You don't need the banks to recapitalize. What you need is financial inclusion and to strengthen the financial, the institutional space, institutions of the state for capital mobilization. If you want to mobilize capital for economic development, it's not the banks. What the banks simply do is financial intermediation trying to bridge the gap, trying to bring together the surplus economic units and the deficit economic units, to market money market activities. If you want to grow the economy, you look at those institutions that can help you drive long-term huge ticket capital. And that is where the capital market comes in. That is where the pension fund industry comes in. Look at the issue of the US, look at South Africa, look at Mexico. As of 2005, South African GDP was 280 billion their capital market then was about $248 billion. <clears throat> Today, the South African capital market is 326% of their GDP, $1.2 trillion. Nigerian capital market today is just about $45 billion, less than 10% of our GDP. And you're talking about recapitalizing the bank. There is no Nigerian that is saying that will go to the capital market to subscribe for shares based on the experiences we have had in this market, especially in the late 20s. We saw what happened between 2008 and 2010. 
artisans, bricklayers, motorcycle uh, or car riders, taxi drivers, mobilize their funds to invest in the capital market. At the end of the day, most of those funds were frittered away. People took those monies, walked away, and nothing happened. I know of a friend who invested all his life savings, his retirement benefits, working 20 years in the gas industry. It's not alliance insurance in IGI, in 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 in, in uh, uh, AIT placement. Today, that one lost is is back to proper stage because nothing happened. Those guys walked walk away with those monies. We need to fix the institutions of Nigeria to be able to mobilize capital. Go to the US, go to South Africa, go to Mexico. You strengthen the capital market. You drive financial inclusion. Today, Nigeria has a huge informal market. What we should be talking about is not capitalizing the big banks. What we should be talking about is how we can grow micro credit, how we can take credit to the rural areas. In the US, if you look at, I took our time to study economies. In the US today, most of the institutions that fund agri, that fund the rural economy, are not the commercial banks. They are agro credit agencies. And some of these guys, they do almost about $389 billion, $25 billion, $134 billion. Go to Indonesia, go to Malaysia, go to Singapore, look around you. You know, this fixation of forcing <coughs> banks to recapitalize and telling them not what to do, it doesn't make sense. As of 2022, Access Bank shareholders fund was about $1.2 billion, uh, $1.2 trillion. Semi Bank was $1.3 trillion, uh, trillion naira. GDP was 932 billion um, um, and naira. And now somebody is telling them, you cannot use your return any. Somebody made a profit and said, okay, I'm not going to spend this money. I want to keep it in my safe. And now you're telling them they cannot use it to recapitalize. And you expect ghosts from the moon to bring money and bring it to the industry because the investors are not wise. They are not looking at you. They so, are not seeing what is happening in the market. So, Nigeria to fix our institutions. If we want to grow our GDP to one trillion dollars in the next five years, is the easiest thing we can do, but so, not through this food that following. So, so let, let's get to that specific that you just mentioned now, and what options are left for the banks? Because initially, when we heard the news, they said, "Okay, the food guys, they're already in a good footing." But with that proviso, it's quite difficult right now. They said for existing banks, I want to read that provision that you stated in passing. The minimum capital specified above shall comprise paid up capital and share premium only. For the avoidance of doubt, the new capital requirement shall not be based on shareholders fund. Now that the bank, uh, the Apex Bank has put this forward, I know you broadly spoken on what should be done. This is not the first, uh, this is not the, uh, necessarily what, sh what will revamp or rebate the economy, but now the CBN has given this directive. So let's walk around the policy of the CBN. What is left to the bank now that this has to be less of shareholders' fund. Very, very, very simple. The banks will summon their shareholders, a ordinary general, general meeting of their shareholders, approve and, and pay out their dividends. It's their money. You cannot tell them. It's like me. I have 100 million naira. Maybe I have 20 million naira in any bank. I have 30 in GT Bank. I have um, 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 the balance in Stambic IBTC. And I want to purchase something. And I'm telling somebody, I'm going to transfer 1 million from Zenit, 1 million from UC. Then the man will be telling me, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want any transfer from GT. Money is fungible. You cannot determine for me what I will do with my money. What these banks will simply do is to call an extraordinary general meeting. Get their banks, they are, most of them are listed on the floor of the exchange. Get their approval of their shareholders to pay dividend. They will pay dividend payout of 80% of what they have in their return earnings. When they pay out those dividends, they will not go back and they do raise a, a new a share offering. And those investors will subscribe back. Because one, if I if I have a if I'm a I'm an investor in a bank that pay me huge dividend, of course I will be motivated to invest more in that bank. So that is the truth. And the, we, we should be very careful here. And even if all the banks recapitalize, let us even assume their whole interest of trying to do this is to see if they can attract foreign direct investors that will come and subscribe to the bank shares, which we know is not going to work. What they are attracting today is FBI because they do, if average investor outside there sees the fundamentals, know the fundamentals. Assuming if all the 24 banks will capitalize to 500 billion naira each, without considering, highest we will attract here will be about five billion dollars in nominal in real terms. Five billion dollars in this economy will amount to nothing. We have a global development master plan. 
that requires us to have consistent capital investment of about 100 billion dollars in this economy if we want to grow this economy to become a one trillion dollar economy it's not by asking bank to recapitalize with banks banks do not mobilize long-term funds what uh -huh. banks uh -huh. do is and you know, Mr. Biare, sorry, let, let me let me come in there. You, you have very, very um, maverick views that are a departure from the norm since the CBN under this new regime announced uh, the policy, the proposition of recapitalization. Others who have aligned with the CBN's view uh, you know, uh, agreeing with the concern that because of the erosion of the value of the Naira, uh, you know, and uh, as against uh, uh, the, the value of the Naira is against the dollar, you know, but uh, the question now is, because uh, there's a report that says that top 10 Nigerian banks have assets net worth to the tune of about 70 trillion naira. So the question now is, what is the growth of the capital adequacy ratio over the period of time since the last recapitalization and the ratio of non-performing loans, which was the concern at that time? What, what is the growth rate you know, of those two um, issues? And if they have grown over the years, do we still need to recapitalize? The, the truth of the matter is that that was not even the reason why the CBN asked them to recapitalize. The uh, straight tests have been carried and the banks in Nigeria are very healthy. There is no bank in Nigeria that is not very healthy. And if you even look at the balance sheet of the banks, you discover that most, those of, most of those banks are not creating risk assets. And that is where the CBN and the fiscal managers also come in here. If you want the banks to lend, you have to, you have to, you have to carry out massive institutional and regulatory reforms, legislative reforms, to be able to de-risk assets, to, to, to de-risk the system. Today, we have a Land Use Act that makes it so cumbersome to transfer land, which is a very, very valuable asset in terms of borrowing. If you go to any bank now to borrow money, if you don't have any land in Ikoi or VI or Abuja, you will not borrow. Even if you have a land in Owere or Abakeleke that are prime properties, they won't take it as collateral. Because of the issue, we expect the government of the day to amend the constitution, amend the relevant laws, to make the ease of transferability of the land asset very, very easy, to make laws that will, that will, that will de-risk borrowing in the system to enable the banks to lend. Today, in at Amco, we have over 5 trillion naira. Right. Toxic assets that we acquired from the banks. Amco was supposed to last for five years. Today, is almost 15 years old. 20%, 65% of that 5 trillion toxic assets are owned by 20 people. Right. And most of these guys are governors today. Some of them are senators. Nothing has been done to them. They are the ones ruling Nigeria. So how do you expect banks when 5 trillion naira had not been recovered? You expect, go and check their returns. Most of the profit they declared last year were fx related profits. Well, Dr. Until Gary, we put the right things, right. the banks cannot let where they should learn. Interesting perspective. We've heard some of the uh, some of these uh, banks, well, at least from some of the officials, saying, "Well, they're in good stead, and they're upbeat about this, saying they will meet that target." Some even say they might surpass yeah. it. But you've raised a vital point: consequences, and, and that's something we need to tidy up. If there's an infraction, if something wrong is done, there needs to be the appropriate consequences. Quite a very interesting conversation we've had with you this morning. We'd like to thank you uh, for these insights, uh, proven uh, quite vital. We've been speaking with Dr. Nemeka Obiareri, who is a development economist and an investment banking executive. I, I know you have a busy day ahead, so thank you for sharing your time with us. I wish you a great day ahead. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh, wow, the economy is always a very hot one. Yes, it concerns our money, so we better pay a lot of attention to it. But we'll shift gears now. We'll talk about the aviation sector. There's been a lot of chatter uh, about that sector of late. And we'll talk about some of those big talking points, the FX situation, uh, safety in that sector, the price of tickets, and the performance of the players. That's in a few seconds. Stay with us.